Good morning and welcome to this, the 23rd meeting of 2017 of the Equality Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that all mobile phones are off the desk and on silent, please? Thank you. Um, and can we welcome back to committee this morning, David Torns. It's good to have you back, David. Welcome. Um, so today we are continuing with our uh, stage one um, uh, scrutiny of the Gender Representation in Public Boards Bill, and we've got one panel this morning. Um, so we're delighted to have at the committee this morning James Morton, who is the manager of the Scottish Trans Alliance, uh, Tanya Castell, who is the chief executive officer of Changing the Chemistry, um, Ian Smith, who's policy engagement team manager of Inclusion Scotland. We'll come back to that side of the table, Ian, and Rebecca Marrick, who is the policy and parliamentary officer of the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, you don't have to switch on your microphones or anything, the, 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 the broadcasting people will all sort that out. Now, I've sort of had a general opening question for, for everyone, um, and it's why do, you, why do you think that this bill would be necessary, and, and where do you think you could influence um, how the bill should operate? And I'll just maybe start with Rebecca, if we can start at your end. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Um, hi, thanks very much for having us along this morning. Um, I think CRER as an equalities organization is always in favor of legislation that goes a ways to improving the situation for groups who are underrepresented in public life. And so I'm not here today to call for homogenization of the bill across the protected characteristics or calling for an introduction of similar quotas for BME groups, but we've just identified a few places we think the bill could be improved so that already disadvantaged groups don't fall further behind, um, particularly around better defining the characteristics that could be considered to allow preference to be given to a candidate who's not a woman around including wider representation consideration and encouragement of applications from more protected characteristics than just gender and definitively requiring the things the public bodies need to publish um, in order to report effectively on their equality monitoring. I think those are relatively simple things that could be done. We maybe also have a less popular suggestion, which is around looking at changing the 50-50 target to a 60-40 target. I think we see potential loopholes and situations in which, for example, a white woman may need to be appointed over an equally qualified black man or a disabled man who you know, would also be able to contribute to the diversity of the board, but might not meet the narrow sort of confines of this bill. I think we're also aware that if you know, a man were to resign from a bill that has a 50-50 balance, the need might be, you know, a black woman may be overlooked in that situation. So I guess we're just looking at why we would want to limit, I guess, to 50% when we're sort of talking about a matter of, of one to two people. And there might be situations in which, especially in sectors that have a high percentage of, of women in the workforce, it may be even better to have a 60% target. So happy to talk about any of those later. Um, so I guess, in summary, we're supportive of the bill, equality initiatives. We're just sort of asking that there be provisions put in place in the bill to make sure that groups who are already quite underrepresented don't fall unintentionally further behind. Okay, thank you very much, Becca. Ian. Uh, thank you. Uh, Inclusion Scotland uh, supports the principles behind the bill in relation to improving the representation of women on public boards. Uh, we would question actually whether the bill is necessary to achieve that, given that all the measures which are proposed in the bill, other than setting the 50% target, uh, can actually be done by ministers at present. Um, there's nothing actually in the bill which changes the powers that ministers actually currently have in order to achieve that 50% balance. However, we do share many of the concerns that Rebecca has just raised about the broader diversity of public bodies uh, and there may be an unintended consequence of this legislation uh, that it actually means to, leads to less diversity rather than more diversity on bills because there will be a legislative requirement on public bodies and ministers to promote uh, the appointment of women, including the uh, measures within the, the, the bill to uh, encourage more applications for women. That may take away from other efforts to encourage applications from other underrepresented groups, including disabled people. Inclusion Scotland did some work on behalf of the public appointments team in the Scottish Government last year, in which we identified a number of areas where work needs to be done to encourage more application, applications from disabled people. And we're concerned that the consequence of this bill might inadvertently be that work to, de to develop those proposals will be shelved because of the legislative requirement uh, to uh, concentrate on the gender balance issue. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Tanya. Um, well, changing the chemistry is, is about um, promoting diversity of thought. So ideally, again, uh, as already echoed, not just about um, gender diversity. And I guess we see gender diversity as a crude proxy for diversity of thought, but it is crude and the danger of putting off other um, types of diversity clearly is a concern. I mean, why is it necessary? I, I do think currently, because of unconscious bias, recruitment is not a meritocracy. Um, and all our biases mean that we are, all of us, um, likely to or tend to recruit people who look and sound like us. So therefore, I do think there is, um, until it's a norm to have um, greater diversity on boards, I do think it makes sense to have um, a bill such as this to help overcome that. However, you would like to think that in time it can become a true meritocracy. So potentially once the target, um, whatever that target should be, has been hit for say five years, the, the bill should disappear because it really should, uh, should ultimately be about meritocracy um, and having the right people on the board. In terms of the target, I guess, I'm interested in the 60-40, I guess from, for me, um, I would be tending to say maybe 40, 40, 20, and therefore your 20, you have a bit more flexibility and again can uh, potentially promote that greater diversity of thought rather than exclusively gender diversity. Thank you, Tanya. James. Um, the Scottish Trans Alliance works specifically on transgender equality and human rights. Um, we work very closely with the women's equality sector in Scotland and find them very good allies. Um, we support the bill. Uh, we think that where there's only 36% currently representation of women on boards when it's 52% of the population, that's a, a really shameful underrepresentation that needs to be addressed. And we welcome any any uh, actions like the bill that uh, help to bring attention to that and move it forward. We are keen and here today to try and make sure that the bill doesn't accidentally um, produce any barriers for transgender people to be involved in boards. Um, we welcome the spirit of the board and think uh, the spirit of the bill and think that it uh, isn't intending to cause any of those of those difficulties. But we need to make sure the wording is correct so it doesn't accidentally do so. Okay, thanks very much, Mary. Thank you, convener, and good morning, um, panel. And my my question follows on nicely from the um, the comments that that James has, has just made, because I'm particularly um, keen to hear a bit more about the the issues, particularly that the um, Equality Network and the Trans Alliance have around the wording in the bill, and the impact that you think um, it could potentially have on trans women, trans men, but I'd also like you to touch on the issue of non-binary because that's a question I've asked in, in, in previous panels and what the impact will, will be on non-binary people. But I would also be grateful if you could give us a bit of a flavour of the barriers to trans people from actually getting to that point where, on, where they're on boards. Okay, so under the trans umbrella, which is uh, anyone whose gender identity varies from the gender they were assigned at birth, uh, we would talk about trans men, that's someone like myself who is assigned female at birth but grows up identifying strongly as a man. Trans women, where someone's assigned male at birth but grows up strongly identifying as a woman. Um, and non-binary people, um, where they find their gender identity is more complex and doesn't fit neatly into the box of man or woman. Um, so within the, the, the idea of increasing representation of women with, on public boards, um, we, we think that that needs to be very clearly inclusive of trans women. Um, we think that the current wording of the bill, it's positive in that it says it's about women. Um, it doesn't try to sort of um, limit that in, in a negative way against uh, trans people, but we need to make sure that it's not a uh, open to misinterpretation. So we would like an avoid a, a bit of extra information for the avoidance of doubt. Um, and we were proposing um, that for the avoidance of doubt, it should say that women includes a person with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment who is living in the female gender, and B does not include a person with the protected characteristic of gender reassignment who is not living in the female gender. So it's about how you live and identify. <coughs> It's not about whether you've gone through the very cumbersome process of getting a gender recognition certificate, because actually at the moment, the vast majority of trans women who have lived many, many years as, as women um, don't actually have gender recognition certificates because it's such a degrading and humiliating process. Um, and it's really important that uh, we don't end up with a situation where 
boards feel they have to scrutinise sort of like kind of the histories and backgrounds and 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 uh, gender reassignment statuses of of uh, trans people because it's that fear of of having your your gender um, unpicked and questioned and kind of the humiliation that goes along with people kind of standing in power going well do we think that what you've what what your life is like meets our criteria for for womanhood um and so that's a major barrier for people applying for for boards it's a major barrier for people even just applying for jobs at the moment um so it's so important that people are are trusted in terms of how they how they identify themselves and um, that's how we would trust people with all their other kind of characteristics and if you look at diversity monitoring I'm really pleased that in Scotland it's it's already sort of like kind of very much about self-declaration. You you get asked how do you identify your gender and you and you write that down and um that's that's how it should be. So if you had that extra clarification, which we've written very carefully so that it's compliant uh, with the the Dave Devold um, powers set out in section 7, uh, 37 of the Scotland Scotland Act 2016. Um and so it's it's refers to the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, so it keeps it in in that uh, required area. And uh, we've used the, the language of living in the female gender because that's based on the language that's already in use, for example, in the Gender Recognition Act 2004. So we think it's a carefully phrased uh, addition for the voice of doubt. To explain a little bit more about the, the issues that people can face, uh, one major barrier that uh, trans people have faced around joining boards has been the requirement to sort of store at companies' house your previous names, um, and st steps are now being taken to try and sort that out. But that was uh, a major barrier, and we had sort of some trans people who'd been invited onto boards but then declined when they realised that actually um, it would it would out them as as trans. Just interrupt you there before you, before yeah. you carry on. And could can you explain when you say steps are being taken? What steps are being taken? Okay, there, there's there's been sort of behind the scenes work about uh, trying to make sure that although the data needs to be held, that it doesn't necessarily need to be available to anybody randomly who happens to look at company's house. But if you if you had a particular need, um, perhaps to investigate sort of a crime or something like that then you could access that information so there would still be the safeguards of storing that information but it wouldn't have the exposure um that that uh, trans people would would be very uncomfortable with um to just sort of go back to non-binary people we we think it's really important that because this bill is focusing on women and um, that it's focusing on the 50 percent target for women including trans women for trans men like myself and non-binary trans people, um, we would end up counted in that other 50%, sort of like kind of, um, and we think that that's uh, acceptable because there's such a small percentage of trans people in the, in society anyway. So um, you're talking about less than 1% of the population. Um, it's probably maybe sort of 0.3% trans women, sort of 0.3% trans men, 0.4% um, non-binary folk. So it's not going to massively affect your percentages. And particularly when you're looking at uh, boards with maybe 10 people on, it wouldn't really make sense to try and achieve a, a, a statistical representation quota for trans people. Uh, you'd end up with kind of an arm of a trans person or something <laughs> like that. Um, and um, so so we're, we're comfortable with, with that. Um, and uh, when it comes to reporting, there will need to be importance of making sure that you don't out non-binary people. So we think that sort of in terms of your diversity monitoring of boards, it should ask you a non-binary inclusive gender question. So it should say, are you a male, female, or do you identify in another way? And um, that's our good practice in, in diversity monitoring. But then when it reports at an individual board level, it could say, for example, of our X number of places on the board, this many are are filled by women, which is a percentage of such and such in terms of representation of women. And it wouldn't need to break down the exact uh, male or other identifications of, of the other members of the board at local board level. When it comes to Scotland-wide, 
um, I think it would be um, useful and would have the potential of avoiding risking outing people if you did break it down at national level across all public boards saying in our total number of places um, across Scotland this many are filled by people who identify as women, this many by people who identify as men and this many by people who identify in another way and that would be helpful to, to know whether there ever was any non-binary people who made it onto boards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. And, and I mean, you, you've explained the addition that you would like um, in, in the bill to give protection to, to trans women. Do you think it would be beneficial in any guidance or policy documents that went along with the bill that there was a further explanation in the guidance of, of what that, that definition actually means and what should be done to actively support and encourage trans women? Yes, I think it's very important that any explanatory guidance makes it very clear that if someone has applied as a woman is using female pronouns in their interaction with the other members of the board, um, then that's all you need to know. You don't need to be digging into sort of like kind of what their birth certificate says or what what if any gender reassignment medical treatment they've had, that those are very personal and private. What matters is how someone is interacting with you um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it's also really important that it's um, the people who are recruiting are, are that it's clarified to them and I, th I would hope that it's done across the different protected characteristics the importance of of having diversity and of making sure that they reach out uh, not just to to non-trans white sort of middle class women but actually sort of make sure that they they advertise and uh, try to recruit a really diverse range of women and, and that they make those proactive steps i think that encouraging that would be very very helpful have you had any interaction with the, the there's on board guidance for, for people who are board members has your organization had any input in that not as yet we've not been involved in that partly because there's only two transgender specific equality and human rights posts in scotland so we've been focused primarily on whether trans people can get into employment at all rather than whether they can be appointed to boards at this moment it's about our priorities and uh, in the future I think we would want to be more involved in that, but it's it's uh, for trans people. It's about trying to make sure you can get to your daily life rather than sort of like kind of a massive focus on 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 getting onto boards. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Thank you, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, we one of the things I'd like to touch on today is the financial implications of the bill on the organisations that will be affected by it. The Finance and Constitution Committee uh, put a call out for uh, submissions on what effect they thought uh, this bill might have uh, financially. Um, unfortunately, only four responded, and one of those responses is sitting here today, which is great. Um, of the responses that we did receive back, uh, three of them were positive that the estimated uh, <clears throat> financial implications of the bill were around £400,000, thought they were adequate and Changing the Chemistry was the only party out of all of the public uh, uh, bodies who were contacted and organisations interested in the bill uh, thought that it wasn't enough. So I just wondered if you could share today uh, why you thought it wasn't enough and how much it should be. Um, so I, I don't have an e exact number. I think it depends, as, as articulated, I think the, the main challenge that Changing the Chemistry had was the assumptions in which it was done. Um, and the bodies, the other bodies who responded um, had not, um, uh, you know, if you look at what has been done, changing the chemistry worked very heavily initially with individual public sector bodies. And I think only, I think it was the uh, Visit Scotland response or, or comment in the actual consultation talked about the work that Visit uh, Scotland had done with us. Um, but I think what people have underestimated is that each body, uh, the way it's set out at the moment, it's not clear how that's going to be implemented such that people are going to find those diverse candidates. I mean, ultimately, the aim of this bill is to, I guess, partly represent society, but also to get better boards. I mean, that's the whole point in terms of changing the chemistry, why we want more diverse boards. So you need to get the right candidates. And at this stage, yes, there's been a lot of work done by both the public appointments team, who have done a great job, plus organisations such as Changing the Chemistry in terms of reaching out to individuals and encouraging them, people who have not necessarily thought about boards, but most of these individuals have never thought about doing a board. Now, we've been doing this for, I guess, two years, 
that's not really enough, two and a half years, to really say, OK, are we going to continue to get that inflow of candidates? Because we've still got all the biases, all the stereotypes, and we've still got a number of people who are not necessarily thinking about going to the boardroom. So the work needs to continue until you've kind of addressed their stereotypes and people thinking about going to board. So for me, it's that outreach piece. So yes, you could carry on and people will advertise. Um, and people will apply for roles, so you'll either get the same people applying, so you're not necessarily bringing that wider diversity of thought in, or you'll get people who are not necessarily prepared. And I've sat on, I've certainly sat on one panel um, for the Scottish Government um, and also Edinburgh College. You know, you need people who understand, one, the process and have had some support on the process, but two, are the right calibre. So if it's, for me, it's about the, the cost to reach out to those. Um, and what the the way it was presented or certainly i understood it from the uh, consultation with um, the members of change in chemistry was it, it's it's how you're going to continue to reach out and get to those it seemed to be incumbent on the individual boards to find those candidates and and to outreach to them and that is to me inefficient um to say okay actually um you know, I am, say, say Scottish Canals, because I'm vice chair of Scottish Canals. I've got to go every time we're, and we're a tiny board with six people, but if we're recruiting, we've got to go and do that outreach. And, you know, we're particularly focused, we actually are gender balanced, um, but we are keen to bring um, greater social diversity and ideally ethnic diversity in, into our board next time we recruit. So, therefore, we would have to go and do all that work. And the time taken for doing that and doing that outreach to do it effectively is not taken into account. Now, I think if you rejig that, potentially, so I think our, our challenge was not necessarily the total amount, but the approach. If you centralise that and continue to use the public appointments team, um, to, who've done a brilliant job in reaching out to different parts of um, both socially, ethnically, all types, to different networks, then I think if, if one was to leverage that and use that to support all those public bodies, then I think potentially the cost wouldn't necessarily be that huge. But that certainly wasn't the way that I'd read how it, the implementation was going to go. Okay, so um, so I guess for st you, you know, a good example, you gave a smaller board or a small organisation which perhaps has less funds available to do proper outreach to get to the target. I mean, you're very lucky in your scenario, you have that quality on uh, the, I think it's Scottish Canals. However, there may be other organisations with smaller boards who... Uh, are, are quite way off the target and will need to do quite substantial amounts of work to get to the target. Do you think that, um, for example, uh, there should be a, a central pot to assist all public boards uh, that the government could create? Uh, and I'm always uh, reticent about asking for, 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 for money without purpose. So I think... You know, is that an idea? Well, yes, yeah, so I think so, so. Some of the work that, say, the Scottish Government Public Appointments Team have done and changing the chemistry has helped them. So, we in the originally we started doing it individually with public sector boards, such as SNH and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And then, for us, given we're a voluntary organization and all our members are working in their spare time, um, we said, okay, that's not practical. So, we then went to the Public Appointments Team and they've reached out to various um, ethnic minority groups, they've reached out to all sorts of different networks to bring um, people in. They run events. And so to my mind, having a pot that they could use in consultation with other groups who can, um, like SEMVO, who are the Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary Organisations, to reach out to those additional networks to bring those in. So I think they could manage that. And certainly one of the conversations Change the Chemistry has had with the Public Appointments team is they've now got that sus. They don't really need us to draw in the diverse candidates. But actually, the next stage is the application process. And the number of applications where people are not used to doing necessarily competency-based applications. Um, and, and there's a good reason for not having CVs, and I personally actually support the process, but therefore what we've said is actually probably changing the chemistry needs to help some of those diverse candidates in doing the application form, so then your credible candidates actually get through the process. So it's having a central pot for that to make sure that those diverse, diverse candidates get it, get it, find out about the roles, are interested in doing the roles, and then succeed in the process. Uh, it's a, uh, an open question. Do you find that people tend to approach boards that they're interested in? Or do you come across people who, th who think, I would really like to be a, a non-exec director on a public board, uh, board 
uh, you know, and then go into a sort of central pot and then they, they, they try and perhaps match you up with a board that's relevant to your interests or experience. Uh, you know, is it a very individualised thing at the moment or could, is there room for a much more centralised approach to recruiting people into boards in general so that that pipeline is constantly fed and the bigger pool is always there? I think it's a bit of both. I think there's also the people who hadn't occurred to them that they're good enough to go on a board. And I'm going to generalise horrifically, but um, generally women underplay. And there is actually quite a lot of research that women will underplay what they've got and men, forgive me, overstate perhaps. Um, <laughs> but there is research there to back that up. So I think there are actually a lot of people I come across and they kind of think, oh, well, I, you know, I'm not really, you know, I couldn't go on a board. And so there are also people really underestimating, so it never even occurs to them. So it's not occurred to them, they're interested in anything and then it's the particular one. But I think to be a really, really good board member, um, unfortunately, it's really easy with Scottish Canals because they're inspirational. You have to have a kind of passion and you have to have an interest. Now, you can sort of grow that interest, but, you know, there's certain types of boards that I probably wouldn't be very good at and um, other ones which, you know... So I think you can do some pooling, um, but there's also a bit about a, a fit and a... Um, what works for the individual. Thank you. Um, and just a final point that's not relevant to that question line is I think, uh, James, in your opening statement, you uh, said that currently 36% of uh, public board members are women. I think just to, for the point of the clarity on the record, I think last week we heard that was up to 45%. So I just wanted to set the record straight. I think that figure of 36 gets used often, but it's a very out-of-date figure. So okay. it's not a criticism. Apologies. Just a yeah, we, we, I, I saw that from the first first uh, um, evidence panel, sort of yeah. like kind of the, the, some of the women's organisations use that as well. So it's, it's thank good you news. for the it's clarification. Got, it's, up, which is it's, it's not my specialist <laughs> subject, <laughs> that <laughs> bit. <laughs> More for the record. Update last week, last yeah. week yeah. from the commissioner, and it was a bang up-to-date figure, and it had been because particular measures have been taken in the past. Uh, very short time, so um, that, that's that's why that that was there. So th thanks, thanks, Jamie, um, Alex. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Thanks very much for coming to see us. I'd like to pick up on uh, remarks made by Ian Smith and Rebecca Marek in their opening uh, salvo about the unintended consequences of the bill. And I think that's always important for any bill committee to consider that. Um, you rightly well, suggest that, that one of the unintended consequences is that we might starve out diversity, as you describe it, um, by in our drive to get gender representation 50-50 on the boards that we might, by exclusion, uh, lose out on other protected characteristics. I just wonder if you thought that the clause in the uh, bill, as we have it, um, under section four, uh, paragraph four, the appointing person must consider the appropriate candidate, um, sorry, the appointment of a candidate identified under subsection two, who is not a woman, is justified on the basis of a characteristic or situation particular to that candidate. My reading of that is that, you, that there is a justification there that the appointing person can take if there is a characteristic which to me sort of suggests a protected characteristic that they might choose to justify why they chose not to pick in a 50-50 situation a female candidate. Is that not strong enough? I think we need to go further back in the process than, than that. I mean, I think there is, it's, it's obviously possible that that clause could be used in that way, although it is not specific and clear that that would be uh, one of the, the specific characteristics that might be considered. Um, but I think the issue is that um, we need to ensure that the bill actually relates to the overall diversity of, of the board and boards in Scotland, not just to the gender one. It can then have a specific target in relation to gender uh, in terms of appointments, but I think there is actually a need to address uh, at the start of an appointments round the, the issue of whether our board is sufficiently diverse um, and what steps need to be taken to address uh, the, any of the underrepresented groups uh, within that. That includes looking at things like the selection criteria for that appointment so that there are no, uh, no barriers. I mean, quite often applications require you to have had previous governance experience or previous experience on a board, and that immediately limits your pool to the already underrepresented, uh, the overrepresented groups uh, on those boards. Um, there are questions as to what are essential criteria for appointment as opposed to that every member of the board has to have some things which some members of the board must have and some things that people might be able to learn on, on the job. And I think there's a tendency to look at too many things that everybody on the board must have rather than saying the board as a whole must have these skills and experiences. Um, 
but not everybody on the board actually needs needs to have them, partly because some people will be new and will learn those skills on the job. So I think there's a, a range of things in terms of selection criteria that need to be looked at to ensure we're not putting people off. Um, I think there's the issue about uh, how you attract and identify potential candidates, which was, was touched on in the last question. Um, again, there's a tendency to um, uh, either people find out about appointments because they've registered for the appointments for Scotland website and get the alerts, um, or they, they see them through some targeted specific uh, um, advertising, as they, they tend not to be generally advertised now, they, they tend to be specifically advertised for particular boards. Again, that might limit your pool because uh, the evidence we have from the work we did last year was that, for example, disabled people tend not to be aware a, that public appointments exist, and B, that they could actually apply for them because there's a view out there that public appointments are for um, the traditional people, the white middle class, males and females, um, who tend to be the people appointed. So I think there are issues about how the Scottish ministers identify the selection criteria, go about the advertising, go about promoting bodies which need to be addressed before you even get anywhere near the appointment stage. Um, that touches also on things like um, accessible communications, uh, support to people who might need help with filling in application forms. For example, people with learning, with learning disabilities who may have a lot to contribute to a board, but may find the, the process very daunting. So uh, a great many, many things there. Um, we would like to see the bill therefore amended to have that general requirement uh, to look at th the overall diversity of the board, not just especially the gender representation. And in particular, we'd like section five to be amended to actually look at how boards um, try to identify and promote applications from all underrepresented groups on the boards, not just from women. At, as I say at the moment, the unintended consequence is that because that will become a legislative requirement, that is all that boards will focus on. Uh, and if they've got limited money, which they, they will have, um, that is all they'll be able to afford to do. They will not be able to go out and reach to other underrepresented groups, such as disabled people or black and ethnic minority candidates. On the subject of which, Rebecca? I think I'd agree with a lot of what Ian was saying. I think we find in our quality work that if a requirement to engage groups with protected characteristics is not explicitly laid out in legislation, and even sometimes if it is, it's often overlooked. So I think it would be our opinion that referencing characteristic is not strong enough or particular enough and not narrow enough. I guess in some cases a board could justify an appointment based on someone having a characteristic of having worked for the body that it's now applying for a board for or having some you know connections that would be useful characteristics i think is quite a a wide ranging thing whereas a protected characteristic narrows it to to the nine defined characteristic ties it into legislation and i think also opens it up for for wider quality considerations i think it's just we see time and time again with you know even the public sector equality duties that if it's not laid out and it's not made explicit it's just not done so I think we would want to see that strengthened and maybe tied specifically to the protected characteristics as defined in the Equality Act. I agree with you. I think, um, I mean, the, the clauses above that suggest that the appointing person needs to pick the best qualified candidate for the post. And to me, that would suggest anyone, you know, who you describe as having perhaps worked for that body before or the relevant experience, that would qualify them in a way that others didn't. So I, th I think that's captured in, in the earlier section. And actually that because they define um, the, the characteristic as they describe it that's particular to that candidate, it makes me wonder if that's what the bill drafters are driving at. And I think this comes up back to the fact that we are missing an element of this in the legislative process, and that is the intimation from Scottish Government that there is no plan for statutory guidance behind this bill. So we have to interpret just on the letter of the law. And I think that's a problem because, um, you know, we, we can in assume or infer that we, we're talking about other protected characteristics here, but unless we get that clarified, then that will be misapplied by the appointing person and, uh, and the board. Which takes me to my next question, if I may. Um, Tanya, um, you talked, uh, uh, you know, very eloquently about the um, the sort of demands on public boards in terms of encouraging um, women to apply, and that's that's certainly true. Um, aside from reporting, that's really the only duty that the bill puts on the the public board, because the appointing person, we're told, uh, we uncovered at the last meeting, is the minister, um, and. I think 
personally, I think we need to clarify that more in the bill than we currently do. Um, but if, the, if there's an equal duty on boards and ministers to encourage the appointment, why do you think we're assuming that all of the costs should fall to the boards to that end? And, and shouldn't we make provision in this bill for ministers to, to find some way um, or, or create, generate resources to that end? Well, I guess, I mean, I agree. I, I think to have it fall on all the bodies just means that you're going to spend a lot more money, I think, whereas having something centrally that promotes and encourages people is, if I understood your question correctly, is actually what I, I do think to continue and probably expand on what the public appointments team do today, supported by organisations such as Changing the Chemistry. I mean, we... Um, all the work that Changing the Chemistry has done with the public appointments team, we haven't charged for. We do this because we have a group of very passionate people who believe very strongly in improving diversity of thought. So, frankly, the money is, tends to be spent on things like just frank, um, you know, uh, booking locations and, um, I don't know, having tea and coffee. So it's not, we're not talking a major expense. But to my mind, to, if you then distribute that to all the bodies, one, you won't necessarily have the skill sets to do that. They won't necessarily have the time to do that. They're already trying to do a lot more with a lot less. So it doesn't make sense to me to then try and get everybody to do the same thing and replicate it in all the different bodies. So to my mind, having something centrally in this particular case, hopefully short term, right? Because ultimately, when you've got enough people up there, you've got the role models there and everybody wants to do it. So it's not a, a long-term thing. That's great. Um, Ian? But, um, the, the, the appointments process involves not just the, the minister and the public body, it involves the sponsoring department, and the sponsoring department should have a responsibility within that to ensure that the board has the resources it needs to widen the, the, the applications. For example, when we did work for, with the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, Transport Scotland funded the seminar we ran, uh, the event we ran to um, promote that those appointments with disabled people in Scotland. Um, so it was not uh, Mobility Access Committee Scotland that paid for that, it was Transport Scotland, the sponsoring department, uh, with the support of the public appointments uh, uh, team within the Scottish Government. So I think there should be a responsibility within the bill on the sponsoring department to ensure the uh, compliance uh, with the requirements, not just on the board itself. Useful, thank you. And um, my final question, if I may convene us to James. James, I, I think you are delineated the, the issue around gender definition very well, and it's something this board, this committee has uh, agonised over in, in respect of our consideration of the bill. Um, do you think, if, if we win the argument with the government that actually we need statutory guidance underpinning this, would that be sufficient to sort of cross or, or, or deal with those issues that you've identified in terms of um, issues around non-binary, issues around uh, trans in general, or do you think we actually need a material change to the face of the bill? I think it would be much, much uh, better if there was the um, clarification for the avoidance of doubt in the actual legislation, because uh, sometimes people read statutory guidance, sometimes they feel like they've understood the bill enough uh, from reading it. I think also, I just don't want it to end up being kind of quibbled over and, and, and kind of I think that having having it in the actual legislation would be very beneficial. It would review, remove that uh, doubt and it, uh, it would just have that stronger, uh, clearer focus than, than putting it into the depth of more detailed guidance. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much. Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Tanya, I was interested in the changing the chemistry submission and I'm going to go back to the reporting aspect. And you laid out very succinctly what you think reporting should cover. Um, but you did put in at the end is that one suggestion is that the number of women being appointed to chair positions should also be appointed on. We haven't touched on that in any of the evidence sessions that we've spoken about. Um, so I would just like you to maybe expand on that a bit. Well, I guess one of the things, and I suppose that's a centralised thing, because clearly in each board there's only one chair, but um, I think that's... That's another piece where the mo I haven't got the latest statistics, so you clearly have much more up-to-date information. I know it was at a hovering around 21%, 22% um, women chairs, but that's maybe a year out of date. Um, so, and, and I know that there is a programme, because I'm part of that, um, to uh, mentor... Um, diverse candidates, because I don't think they're all women, um, to kind of aspire to be uh, chairs of public sector bodies. But I think that's another area where, again, potentially there's bias can creep in um, in terms of those appointments and, you know, the 
people can be a little bit uncomfortable with a candidate who looks a bit different from the past. So I think that's another area of it would be worthwhile to have greater transparency so that people can see the progress. And how do you think that the boards or the bodies that the boards represent should um, approach the training? Because we have spoken in evidence sessions in the past about um, it, it being a confidence issue for women to step forward and put themselves forward for these positions and explaining a lot more of what a board does, what their role would be on it, how they would be fantastic and their skills would be used. And um, how, how would we then go about taking that next step up into a, a chairperson position? Well, as I say, so I think the mentoring programme that's underway is um, a very good start in terms of helping um, individuals think about it. I mean, I, I suppose my view, if we're focusing on women, and clearly I meet an awful lot in terms of what changing the chemistry does, is I, I kind of think... We are, there, I meet a lot of very confident women. I think what I, the way I tend to describe it is we undervalue ourselves. So we don't necessarily appreciate what we've got to give. So I think it is very much about, um, certainly once um, individuals have got onto boards, helping them, um, one, understand the, the board dynamic and get comfortable in it, but two, for, particularly for people coming from different backgrounds, be it third sector or private sector. So my background's private sector. So for me, the bit that I've wanted to get comfortable with is how to interact with government. You know, how does that relationship with your sponsor team work? How, how if I want to influence and, and get the right... Um, for my board to do the right things, to have the right communication, build the right relationships, how is that different to what I've seen in the past? So I think it's um, probably doing more of and developing, um, uh, I guess, some of the training programs to be, what are those different aspects, such as, you know, a, a different it's a different type of board to be on a public sector board, um, and then developing the chairing uh, techniques you know, how you manage a board, you know, the, for example, even the order you ask questions can actually, m frankly, manipulate the answer, um, you know, round, round the boardroom. So I think it's, it's having some of those workshops to encourage and, again, help people realise that they are very capable of doing that. Um, and I think as well, getting the language correct, and it's not a chairman anymore, it's a chairperson. <laughs> Refer to myself as a chair. Um, Rebecca, you, uh, you started off by um, addressing the either well 6040 or 602020 aspect of it. Can you maybe explain a little bit more about how you think that would work, how it would help? Sure. Um, I guess when we consider the size of boards, we're really looking at it a difference of one to two people, maybe between a 50% and a 60 or 40%. And I guess over a period of time, it's likely that might fluctuate. Uh, I think our argument is why should it not be 60% women for some boards, especially in sectors in which women are overrepresented. Um, you know, for years it's been 70, 80, 90% men, so I don't think we should cap it at 50 necessarily for women. But I think we're also looking at, I guess we just see a lot of room for, for loopholes in terms of needing to, feeling required to promote a woman over black man or a disabled man and sort of almost prioritizing one characteristic over another, which I don't think is the intention behind the bill, but might be the result. I think you're tiptoeing into territory where you could almost create an unintentional ceiling for women who may, in terms of a 50% cap, but then also unintentional barriers for people from more underrepresented characteristics on board. If you know, someone's aware that a woman has vacated a position on a balanced 50-50 board and is aware that the board will probably be keen to represent another or appoint another woman to sort of keep that balance there, then I think we could assume that a black man might hesitate to apply for that. And if there's, you know, a lot of strong rhetoric around gender representation, then I think people from other characteristics who struggle a bit more than women do in terms of representation might that throws up another barrier for them in a way. So I think that that was our kind of thinking behind it. Um, I guess another issue that we touched on is that this doesn't pertain, I guess, to um, executive members. And if your executive members tend to be, you know, your chief executives, your chief financial officers, oftentimes those are men. So a 60% allowance, I guess, offers the potential that the entire board bringing in executive members might then achieve a 50-50 balance. But if it's kept at a 50-50 for those non-executive members and executive members are overwhelmingly men, then 
that's another potential for imbalance. So I guess we just find that the, a strict 50-50 target maybe creates additional barriers or limits potential in some ways or discourages groups from other protected characteristics. So a 60-40 suggestion, but I guess we just wanted to highlight kind of the issues that we saw with that. Your perception in reading the bill that you think there's a 50% cap or that it's a strict 50-50 because our, our interpretation is it's at least 50-50 so there is some of that flexibility in there but if your perception is reading it another way and, and we are not seeing that then we need, to, we need to deal with that as well. I guess maybe that is the way that, that we read it and I apologise if we've no, no, gotten I'm the wrong saying, stick I'm not saying our way or your way is the, the, the right or wrong way. It's just if there's a perception uh, out there, we need to deal with that perception because then we're building in um, a, a, a barrier there that may be that, that's, that's unintentional. I guess I will say that is the way that we perceived it um, and maybe that is another way in which statutory guidance would be immensely helpful yeah. in this area yeah. is okay. laying that out a bit further. But I guess even... If it's a 50% minimum, that doesn't totally remove the issues that we also spoke about where black men, disabled men might hesitate to apply because of a 50% minimum. So I guess still other issues, but I guess perhaps the language used on a 50-50 does okay. complicate okay. the situation. Okay, Gail, before I, I let you back in, Jamie's got a quick supplementary. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it quick. Um, so. I, I, I guess I'll maybe ask the question that Annie might have asked if she was here, but she's not here. It, it, given the situation at the moment, if we end up in a, fifth, a scenario where the, we're going through the recruitment process, uh, there are two candidates which are of equal merit uh, in the words of the bill. Um, at the moment, the bill dictates that the preference should be given to the female candidate in order to meet the quota. How do you think that would affect a situation where you had a female candidate and a male candidate with another protected characteristic? At the moment, the bill will give preference, or it says that the board should give preference to the female candidate. What effect do you think that may have on that scenario? It's a very unique scenario because, you know, how do you define equal merit? But, you know, if you end up in that situation, you know, I'm, I'm worried that boards might be, might, might be nervous about how they deal with those situations. Yeah, I definitely agree that that could create, you know, some tension and some confusion in boards, and I guess... Maybe that's one of the reasons we were arguing for that change in Section 4 where characteristic is a bit better defined and maybe specifically references the protected characteristics to sort of go away to addressing that issue. And I think that's another area where statutory guidance could go away to offering further clarity that it's not just about balancing your board in terms of gender, but it's about looking at other areas in which your board lacks diversity and the importance of bringing that into your consideration with appointment. So I do think that's a, a difficult issue and one which might not be able to be addressed fully on the face of legislation and guidance would go a ways towards looking at as well as defining what we mean by a characteristic. So I was just going to add that of course it would actually be the minister making that decision because he would have both of those on the list. As the appointing person. Yeah. yeah. If it's a regulated post. If it's a regulated, yes. Yeah. Scottish Canals actually isn't yeah. regulated. Okay. Gail, do you want? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, Ian, can you maybe give some insight into your opinion on the 60-40 or 60-20-20 example? And how do boards go about recruiting more disabled people? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Just jump in there a wee bit because I've got on my wee list of things here that we need to tick off is about person specifications and how do we ensure that person specifications don't have inbuilt unconscious bias um, and that, that's something that we've been following through for the past few weeks but I had it on my list just in case nobody but it, it ties in really nicely with, with Gail's yeah. question. So. Um, the, the, the issue, I mean, I, I think there has to be flexibility at the margins uh, and that's really where I think the um, Section 4.4 that uh, Alec referred to comes in and perhaps needs to be reworded to make sure that that is there. I mean, we, you could get the situation, for example, that um, you have a board which currently has 45% uh, 40, white middle-class women and 55% white middle-class men. The two applicants with equal merit um, are a, another white middle-class woman uh, and a disabled ethnic minority gay man. Um, and the uh, minister decides in order to meet the target, they have to appoint the middle-class woman. 
um, and that doesn't do much for the diversity of the board, frankly. Um, so I think there needs to be clarity that uh, the over and that's why I think the bill, board, the bill needs to be changed to include an overall look at the diverse nature of the boards and, and boards in general. Um, the personal specification issue is very important um, because there is a serious risk that the personal specifications simply repeat what is currently on a board. Um, and um, if your board is not particularly diverse at present, the chances of you putting the same person's specification down, you'll end up with the same board, uh, people applying for the board. So I think it is important that we look very carefully at the person's specifications, and that's one of the issues there is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, looking at the uh, overall requirements of the board, not necessarily the requirements of an individual point. Um, all boards will require somebody who has some understanding of governance and finance, but not everybody on the board will need to have that because there will be people there who can advise and support them uh, and they will learn on the job. Um, and by having sort of traditional previous experience in governance and finance, um, you tend to limit your pool of people to traditional uh, characteristics um, such as middle class lawyer types or accountant types. Um, by definition, people who have come from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to have built that experience up because they'll have had less opportunities. Uh, for other big, uh, disabled people, they may have not had the opportunities through education um, or they've had faced barriers in other parts of their life and therefore not had an opportunity to develop that experience and skills. So you need to have within your personal specifications other ways in which people can demonstrate that they have their qualities that are needed to be a good board member, which are not necessarily the traditional qualities that people tend to think about uh, in the tick box exercises. Uh, so your specification grids, um, your matrix, which they use to uh, analyze um, the qualities needs to be more imaginative, needs to have less. You must have this um, uh, particular skill uh, unless you're actually looking for somebody with a particular requirement for a particular job. Um, but for a board, you've probably got uh, a, bit, a better mix than that. So uh, I think there are ways of doing that. Um, we, we had a look at that in the, uh, the exercise we did with the Mobil Mobility and Access Committee Scotland. Um, and we did find there were some problems about defining what was an essential skill and what was a desirable skill and what was something you might learn on the job. But I think those are areas which do need to be examined in general in terms of public appointments, not just in terms of gender representation, but for all uh, diverse groups. Done some of this work, so if you could enlighten us, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so certainly, um, well, it's a change in the chemistry, but also I would say I know that the public appointments team has also done a lot, and I know that some of the ones that change in the chemistry worked with, say, um, when we were looking at the Visit Scotland and some of the more recent ones, they've massively softened down some of the criteria. So rather than saying you have to have been on a board, it's, you know, have you worked, um, have you supported a board, have you been, in, you know, sort of advised a board, but also some of it around, you know, team working. So that actually in terms of the general guidance that the public appointments team give out to sponsor teams it, they have kind of tried to soften that wording and to give a much wider set of examples having said that I do think it is when I look at some of the notices that go out I do think there's also something about selling an organization and I guess um, you know I looked at one it might have been quite close to home and I kind of looked at it I thought well that really doesn't describe the organization and I wouldn't apply for that you know so it's about how do you you know there are some amazing organizations it's about so it's you know what is that that organization about and it's not as you say about governance or whatever and I I'm not an ex-accountant or lawyer, but I am an ex-banker, so I definitely sit in the white middle class, went to a nice university and everything else, so I'm not very diverse, I accept that. <laughs> um, but I think it, it, it is very much about getting that, so it's getting the wording softer, and there's, again, there's a lot of research about um, how you word it to be inclusive. I think quite often um, more context can help people who are less familiar with um, what this is about, but then also it's, of course, getting that specification to the individual individuals and finding those individuals, um, persuading them that they, this is really actually great fun. Rebecca. Yeah, too much. Person specifications, but I guess um, on the subject of measures that can be taken to help at the appointment stage, I think the work that the Equal Opportunities Committee did last year in their Removing Barriers report um, put forward a lot of su useful suggestions for employment that I think could also be applicable to boards, I think we definitely find that when the interview panel has a BME 
representative on it, it's much more likely that BME people make it through to interview stage and are successfully appointed. I think for BME groups, we're not operating on a deficit model. You know, we're, the groups outperform their white Scottish peers in attainment and going on to positive destinations. It's not a lack of qualifications. It's, again, an issue of, of discrimination and conscious or unconscious bias. And I think, and again, this is beyond the scope of the legislation, but I just wanted to, to put forward that there's a need to sort of look at where discrimination has an effect and what evidenced measures can go to counter that. And I just wanted to cite that report as a good resource to look towards. Thank you. Gail, did you want to come back? Yeah, I just want to touch very quickly on something um, that I read in Rebecca's report. And I was, it, I was really interested in it, actually, and it's about the getting um, underrepresented groups onto boards when they're already underrepresented in the workplace. And you did use the words underlying racism and discrimination. And I wondered um, if that applies to the workplace in some instances for some protected characteristics. Would that also apply to boards as well? Do you think that some people with protected characteristics at the moment are maybe put off applying because they do feel that there is these underlying tensions in some way? I definitely would agree. I think just as an example, um, one of the few sectors in which BME people do hold quite high positions is the health sector. And I think in some instances, people have faced discrimination and racism in the workplace and might have a hesitation to apply for a board because they think that's just kind of opening the door for that to happen again. And despite their qualifications, they don't you know, look like the people on the board. What's the point of sort of applying? And I guess that's maybe goes back to one of our worries with if the focus remains solely on gender, those groups feel like that's another barrier thrown up. And I, talking about you know person specifications and the qualifications people need to have to be on a board and to achieve in a meritocracy. I think when groups are, BME groups are underrepresented in employment, underrepresented in um, higher level positions, they're less likely to have those qualifications that get them through to those boards. So, I mean, the issue is, is with the entire pipeline. And I guess with this piece of legislation, we're really looking at five to 600 positions and people who are already quite well along in their careers and have achieved a good amount. Um, and for BME groups, I think the problem lies much further back. And like I said, and you know, like the Equal Opportunities Committee last year found, it's not an issue of qualification or merit. It's an issue of discrimination that's present in, in public bodies and the need to address that. So I do think it's it's an issue. Boards, you know, if we go to, you know, the Scottish Attitude Survey and find that some 20% of Scottish people still think it's appropriate to discriminate against people, then. I think it's fairly fair to assume that that 20% exist in the workplace, and in some cases that 20% exist on boards, and that discrimination is, is present at that level then. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, so I guess then that leads me on. I mean, gender representation on boards, Bill, do you think that we're missing a trick by just making it gender? I, I do think so. I think. Quotas are hard to do for, for BME groups. Um, in the latest census, you know, it's 4% of the population. We anticipate it doubling by the time the cens next census comes around. But so I think quotas are, are tough to do for race, but I do think there are definite places in the bill in which it could be extended to other protected characteristics in a way that would make it clear that diversity in all its forms is valuable and something that we should strive to achieve on our public boards. And I guess that's what the amendments that I put forward in our supplementary legislation are about. It's not about quotas across the board, and I, I understand why that is an important measure for, for gender, but it's about having some cognizance about what that might mean for other protected characteristics. Okay. Is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the only uh, thing that we've not managed to cover this morning, and we took lots of evidence on it last week, was on sanctions and whether there should be sanctioned. And we had some evidence last week that um, suggested that a sanction too far could have that scatter effect, where people just wouldn't touch the board because of the sanctions that are maybe involved. But there's, there's obviously some sanctions needed to be put in place in order to, to make sure that there's no rollback from progress made. I just wonder if you've got any opinion on sanctions and what they should be. Ian? Uh, 
I'm not entirely sure what the purpose of sanctions would be. The danger of sanctions, of course, is that you then focus solely on the uh, target of 50% plus of, uh, of women uh, on boards, and you don't actually look at any of the other diversity issues, and you, you ignore Clause 4.4 uh, about possibly using it to, in, to, to support other protected characteristics. Um, what is the, I think the most effective sanction is effective reporting uh, and monitoring by uh, this parliament um, by, and by this committee to actually examine whether or not the, uh, the, the ministers, in fact, who were responsible, uh, are actually meeting the requirements of the bill uh, and hopefully the wider requirements of, of wider diversity of public bodies. I think that is the most effective sanction. I'm not entirely sure what other sanctions you would have because you'd have to um, examine every single appointment uh, and find out if in any single appointment the minister has failed to take account of the bill. And in fact, the public uh, appointments commissioner already has that power. He was very clear about that last week. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Thank you, convener. Mine, mine's something more of a comment, but I'd like there are a few uh, reflections of the panel on uh, the convener's point about sanctions. I mean, I, I admit to having done something of a volt fast on this in the sense that as my understanding of the bill has improved, so too has my view on sanctions changed. Because if the only duties on public authorities are to encourage female candidates to apply and to report to ministers in respect of that first duty, then I don't see A, how any public authority is going to fail in that duty and B, what sanctions you could hope to do. If ultimately the buck stops with the appointing person, then the only person you should sanction is the appointing person. And if that's Scottish ministers, well, that's a whole different story. But does the panel agree? Tanya? I mean, I, I guess there is one other bit. So having put these diverse candidates who almost certainly haven't been on boards before, there is an also a bit on the boards to support those individuals. And I do see uh, on at least one of the boards, I'm on a range of boards, so on one of the boards I'm on, where it's been, it's become more diverse and actually that's caused more challenge. I mean, if you, and, and you know, there's certainly there's research out there that shows that more diverse boards, one, they take longer, because of course you've got to hear all the different perspectives. Um, and there is a little bit more tension. Now, actually, that's good. As long as tension doesn't go to conflict, that's the whole point of having that diversity of thought. So you want some of that tension, but it also means it's a harder job for the chair to do. So the, and you've got people who don't, who haven't necessarily seen a board before, and don't, you know, I mean, all my boards, I think that I'm on, are different, and you know, at different times, each one of them has kind of you've got a moment where you know I feel like going in the corner and crying. <laughs> frankly, sometimes you know it's hard. It's really difficult, and you have to be incredibly strong. You know, human nature is also to conform. You know, we are much more comfortable conforming. It can be painful not to conform. So there are all these different dynamics, and you're bringing people who are not necessarily used to that environment. So I do think there's another piece, um, and I guess this has evolved possibly since changing the chemistry put our response in, in terms of thinking about some of the experiences I've seen in boardrooms over the last couple of years about there is an onus on that body to make sure that people who are new to the boardroom are fully supported and encouraged and that you take time to build the connections and the relationships to make that diversity, which by definition brings a little bit more tension, if it's going to add value, um, how to make that work. Can I Ian, just yeah. add to that? I, mean, I think that's a very important point. I think one of the uh, things that we believe uh, is, is necessary is that uh, boards and indeed selection panels need to have a proper uh, equalities training, uh, disability equality training, general diversity training, in order to ensure that there are no, or they minimise the number of unconscious bias that they may have in them. But also, I think there are other things that can be done uh, to support new applicants. For example, you could appoint somebody. Um, well in advance of them actually taking the appointment, who can then sit and shadow the board uh, in a sort of apprenticeship way for a while so they get used to the procedures, understand how it works, uh, and therefore when they can actually come to taking power on the board, actually have a better understanding of what's going on. You have mentoring and peer support systems in place, a whole range of, of, of other things which can help support people from diverse backgrounds uh, and with less experience uh, become available. Also, obviously, ensuring that all the proceedings of the board are fully accessible in terms of um, the, the types of uh, documents that are produced are, are in accessible formats and so, and so on. Uh, 
And also a very important point is ensuring that if you get down to this, you don't want to get down to this sort of quota business because you end up with the concern that disabled people have that they are on boards in a tokenistic way. They're just there to make up the numbers and are treated in a tokenistic way. They have to be full participating members of the board and not just tokenistic. So I think these are all very important things. Um, returning to the sanction issue, I suppose the ultimate thing is if a board is failing to do these things, it's failing to provide support for this, uh, to encourage diversity, uh, the ultimate sanction is that the minister doesn't reappoint the chair the next time they come up for re renewal, or indeed sacks the chair, which is, still, is an option that's available to ministers. Well, that's, that's interesting. I think we have well, well, over, well over our time this morning, because we've, we've had some uh, excellent evidence. We're incredibly grateful to you for your evidence this morning, and the written evidence that you've given as well. And I'll make the usual proviso as convenient. If you go away and you think, oh, I should have said that, or you know, should have mentioned this, please let us know. We've still got a, another couple of weeks before we get the minister in front of us, uh, before we get to the end of stage one of this, this uh, inquiry. So thank you so much. And that ends our... Uh, public section of the committee this morning and I'll move into private.